I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. My God is my rock, in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. I called on the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and he saved me from my enemies. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you that when we call on you, you answer us, and you rescue us and save us. As we worship you today, God, just be with us in this place. Fill us with your spirit, and help us to worship you in spirit and truth. In your holy name I pray. Amen. enough for us and we're here to celebrate God's amazing grace, God's 
passionate involvement in our lives and in our world. If I haven't been able to meet you yet, my name is Josh Broward, and it's my great joy to serve as the lead pastor here. I've been gone for a couple of weeks with our Bangladesh team. Thank you for your prayers. We had a great trip, and you'll hear more about that later. God's grace was enough for us there, more than enough for us. Uh, now, I want to give you a chance to turn and greet each other, welcome each other, give somebody a handshake or a hug, and also I want to encourage you, if you uh, feel free, if you feel uh, like you really want to show grace to others, move down closer to the front and move in, uh, because as the fall starts, uh, we're getting more people, so we need to make space for the people who will be coming later today. So if you would, move down and in as you're greeting people. Turn and welcome somebody.
let's pray. Father, we want to thank you this morning for all that you have revealed about yourself in the Bible. I want to thank you that it is in written human communication that you revealed yourself. And we look forward this morning to finding out more about the wonder of who you are. Through this man, David, we ask for your help as we pay attention to what you say. And we bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen. The gospel lesson this morning is in Luke chapter 13. Then Jesus said, What is the kingdom of God like? How can I illustrate it? It is like a tiny mustard seed that a man planted in a garden. It grows and becomes a tree, and the birds make nests in its branches. He also asked, What else is the kingdom of God like? It is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Now the epistle lesson. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us, don't be fooled by what they say. For that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call good and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. Don't you remember that I told you about all this when I was with you? And you know what is holding him back, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. But the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. This man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. Friends, this is the word of God. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Today we are finishing our series through First and Second Samuel, and most of this chapter is actually the same as Psalm 18. The the whole psalm is repeated in 2 Samuel as part of David's story because he wrote this psalm as kind of a summary of how God had helped him throughout his life, particularly when he was struggling with enemies. Now, we're only going to read a few parts of this psalm because it's actually really long. But as we read, I want you to listen for four key themes. Rescue, refuge, rehabilitation, and reassignment. So first, there's a beautiful introduction section. And David sang this song to the Lord on the day the Lord rescued him from all his enemies and from Saul. He sang, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me. 
and my place of safety. Next is the rescue section. The waves of death overwhelmed me. The floods of destruction swept over me. The grave wrapped its ropes around me. Death laid a trap in my path. But in my distress, I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I cried to my God for help. He reached down from heaven and rescued me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemies, from those who hated me and were too strong for me. Then comes refuge. He led me to a place of safety. He rescued me because he delights in me. For he is a shield for all who look to him for protection. For who is God except the Lord? Who but our God is a strong rock? God is my strong fortress. Now, next comes something we might not expect. Rehabilitation. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, enabling me to stand on mountain heights. He trains my hands for battle. He strengthens my arm to draw a bronze bow. You have given me your shield of victory. Your help has made me great. Now, the final move may be even more surprising and uncomfortable. Reassignment. I chased my enemies and destroyed them. I did not stop until they were conquered. You have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued my enemies under my feet. You placed my foot on their necks. And then David finishes with a conclusion of praise. The Lord lives, praise to my rock. May God, the rock of my salvation, be exalted. I grew up singing this verse. The Lord liveth. And blessed be the rock, and may the God of my salvation be exalted. Many, actually probably most of the songs that we sing in church have roots in the scripture, sometimes direct quotes like that one. Over the past two weeks, uh, nine people from our church community were in Bangladesh visiting our partners where our church is helping to build a village for widows and orphans. And we had the great privilege to see this psalm lived out in person in Bangladesh. Bijoli uh, it was an orphan as a child. Our pictures today are going to be a little bit bluish because our uh, projector is having some problems. Bijoli faced staggeringly bad options as an orphan. One was near slavery in a home or in a sweatshop. Second was homelessness and life as a beggar or a thief. And third was prostitution. However, Bijoli was rescued. She was given refuge in an orphanage sponsored by Christians in the Church of Bangladesh. Over the next decade or so, she experienced a beautiful rehabilitation. Despite her difficult beginnings, she learned about God's love and developed a beautiful personality full of joy. She had peace as part of her inmost being. And she studied well. She's very smart. And she showed great potential for leadership and ministry. So a bishop in her church introduced Bijoli to Kishur, a promising young layman. Bijoli and Kishur married, and Bijoli talked Kishur into studying theology. Then they started a church together. Uh, later, it, they faced such financial difficulties as pastors in a Muslim country that they weren't able to continue with that church, and they joined the staff of a hospital sponsored uh, by Christians. Bijoli studied and worked as a nurse, and Kishur studied and worked as an x-ray technician. Later, when that hospital closed because of some external difficulties, they took jobs at a Nazarene school in the southern part of Bangladesh. Bijoli was the principal of the school, and Kishur was the project manager, the manager for the whole project at that site. They were faithful and effective in that post. So when the Church of the Nazarene was looking for a couple to be the leaders of our village of hope, they called on Kishur and Bijoli. When Kishur and Bijoli moved to the village of hope in 2010, uh, it was dry and dusty. Uh, 
I'm not sure you can tell, but there was hardly any grass around the village. And there was just one crooked, lonely little tree, a few houses, and nothing else for several kilometers. Bijoli immediately began gardening, which we found out on this trip is her hobby. In September of 2011, there were seven houses, and the first five families moved in. One widow and six orphans to each house. Our second mission team funded fruit trees, and Bijoli added flower gardens in front of every house, along with a community vegetable garden. After returning from our third trip in February of 2012, Park Moon Sheik said that the Village of Hope looked like a Garden of Eden. And I didn't go on that trip, and I couldn't quite understand what he meant until I saw it for myself. There are literally flowers everywhere, all along the sidewalks, in front of every yard, in all of the community spaces. The whole village is a well-tended garden. Kishore told us that some of the kids help with the gardening, with the flowers. And they do this as part of their rehabilitation. Kishore said that a child who learns to care for flowers will not kill people. A child who loves flowers cannot hate people. He said developing appreciation for beauty and empathy for living plants actually changes our hearts and empowers us to see beauty in others. Flowers help us love better. Kishore and Bijoli live with such deep joy and trust that they exude, shine, the life of Christ. One of them is usually gently teasing the other or someone else, but they do it with so much love and grace that the only possible reaction is to join in their laughter. The most common image I have of Bijoli is her tilting her head back in a roaring laugh. She does it so often. When we asked Kishore and Bijoli what was the secret of their exuberant love for each other and their passion for life, they said simply that they trust each other and God without limit. Kishore and Bijoli manage the village with efficiency and grace. The children obviously love and respect them. The children obey Kishore and Bijoli without question and without the slightest hint of resentment. And the widows, here's one of them on the left, they follow Bijoli's example of firm but tender love. And they replicate in five more homes Bijoli's same joy and peace. And soon they'll be adding four new homes with four new widows and 24 more children in our village. So stay tuned, we'll have more kids ready for you to sponsor in the next few months. I was uh, very pleased to see Bijoli still uses her nurses training in our village. When I injured my leg at the construction site, actually when I was kind of goofing around, uh, she pulled out the first aid kit and lined up four different items for me to use and told me the exact order in which I should use them. When Deep, their oldest son, could not understand the inadequate science textbook that his school was using, Bijoli simply created a new auxiliary textbook complete with illustrations of biology and chemistry examples. Bijoli was an orphan, lost in desperate hopelessness in one of the poorest countries in the world. But she was rescued and given refuge in a loving Christian community. The body of Christ facilitated her rehabilitation. And then God reassigned her in God's mission of healing our world. Bijoli, you can see her uh, second from the right in the top. She is a living example of God's grace through refuge, rescue, and rehabilitation. And now her life has moved full circle as God has reassigned her to this village of hope 
where she is helping God and the church and us give rescue and refuge and rehabilitation to a whole new set of orphans. And I was thinking today, as, as Daniel read our gospel passage, we think of orphans as so small and insignificant, but they're really like the mustard seed in our story. And Bijoli is proof that these seeds can grow up into a great tree that then gives shelter to others. For our church here in Korea, we experience refuge and rescue and rehabilitation and reassignment in many different ways. Of course, there's the fundamental rescue from our sins and the destruction that sin brings to our lives and to the lives of those around us. When we were dead in our sins, completely lost without hope, Christ died to save us. This is the heart of the good news. But for many Christians, this is as far as they get, just avoiding hell. But the church, when it is healthy, functions as a refuge from the storms of life. Our Christian brothers and sisters give us a support network to shelter us in our times of great struggle. And above and beyond the church is Christ our rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When all else fails, God is a rock and a fortress for us, a place of safety for our souls. Our identity and our personal worth are safe in God's care because he loves us as we are and his love never fails. God's love is a solid rock, a shield of prote protection for us because he delights in us. And many Christians stop here also, but David's psalm and God's work continues with rehabilitation. God is not content to rescue us out of danger and give us safety. God wants to restore us, body, mind, and heart. God is constantly working to strengthen us, to make us more healthy and more whole. And then finally comes the last step. We may be uncomfortable with the battle imagery in this psalm. Most of us know very little about battle, but we can't miss the point. After rescue, refuge, and rehabilitation, God is thrusting us back into the battle of life, reassigning us to participate in his mission. After he has strengthened us, strengthened our arms to draw a bronze bow, it's time to use it. A great many Christians, perhaps most of us, never get to this point. We know we need rescue, forgiveness for our sins, and help. We know we need refuge, especially when life is hard. Sometimes we're reluctant to do the hard work involved in rehabilitation, but once we get started, we know that it's good for us. But very often, we resist reassignment. We want to stay in God's refuge, safe in the community of God's people. We want to stay in a posture of always receiving from God. Or we want to be continually practicing for doing battle, studying the methods of battle without ever actually doing any battle. I remember Rick Warren's words that most Christians don't actually need to study the Bible more. I know that sounds like heresy. He says we pretty much understand, most of us understand enough of the Bible what we really need to do is live the Bible more. Thankfully, most of us will never engage in a spiritual war, in a physical war. We'll never draw a bow or shoot a gun at another human being. However, we still live in a battlefield. Our opponents are not flesh and blood. Our weapons are not of this world, but we fight the enemies of greed, violence, selfishness, prejudice, sin, poverty, falsehood, and injustice 
with the spiritual weapons of faith, hope, peace, joy, truth, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Eventually, love will subdue all our enemies. Love wins. Love never fails. God is rescuing and healing us. But God is also sending us back out into the world to participate in the rescue and healing of others. I think the last picture there, Becky. And this too is part of our healing. As everyone who has gone on one of our Bangladesh trips can testify, this assignment, this reassignment or mission to Bangladesh heals us just as much as it does those we go to serve. The same is true for our daily assignments to join in God's mission of love and healing wherever we are. Loving others with God's deep love heals our hearts just as much as it heals those we love. God is using us to provide rescue, refuge, and rehabilitation and reassignment to others. But this is just the beginning, just the beginning for our church and just the beginning for us. My prayer is that God will continue to transform us more and more into a loving community that changes our world more and more. And this transformation, this healing of others, this loving community will also be for our healing as well. Adam, would you come and pray for us? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this, this opportunity this time to just gather here and worship you not only in song, but in listening of your words. Lord, your words are timeless. The, meanings, the meaning of your words lasts forever, Lord. I pray that you bless us with the idea of love, the idea of, the idea of being able to just show what we've learned to others, Lord. To be able to recreate your love in ourselves and to others, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you take these words that we have listen to today. We let them grow in our hearts. Let us become those words, Lord. And we share them in our lives with others, whoever we meet, whether they're Christians or non-Christians, family or friends or strangers, Lord, that we become shining examples of what you are to us. Pray, Lord, that, that also pray for the new semester that's starting to, Lord, that you just give us that love that will just go beyond who we are and that who we stand for, Lord, and that it just becomes non-resistant, Lord. I just pray that you just give us grace. And I pray, amen. On the night before Jesus went to the cross, he shared a meal with his disciples. He took the bread and he gave thanks for it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take this and eat it and remember me. And he took the cup and he said, this is is my blood which is poured out for you. Take this and drink it and remember me. So we come to his body and his blood, to this meal, the Lord's Supper, remembering Jesus and living, putting our faith, our trust in him and we come, this, this meal is called communion, which means basically living together or life together, uniting together, 
So we unite together with Christians all over the world, together with Christ. As we unite with Christ, we unite together with the body of Christ around the world. So that we can live what we've heard today. Rescue, refuge, rehabilitation, and reassignment in God's loving mission of healing our world. And today we have a special way of communion or uh, togetherness. We, one of, uh, one of the places that we visited in Bangladesh was a self-help group at a nutrition and food security center. Uh, this was the first time somebody from our church had gone to one of these places and it's one of the Church of the Nazarene's biggest projects in Bangladesh. They have 70 of them. And they do three basic things. They help people grow better gardens so that they can have better food for their families. They uh, run self-help groups where uh, 20 women get together every week and save money. And then when they get enough money saved, they make a loan to one of the women in their group. And that woman uses that money uh, to buy something that will help her make more money to take better care of her family. And then she repays the loan in about three months and somebody else borrows money. The group that we visited had been meeting for about a year and a half and they had made three loans. Uh, one woman bought a rickshaw, uh, one of the little bicycle carts, uh, and her husband is driving that uh, and earning income for their family. Another woman, I, I can't remember what the, what the others did. They each bought uh, a few more things or a few things to use for a small business that would help their family. Then another thing they do is they teach the moms how to have good hygiene and good nutrition in their home. And one of the first things they teach them is how to make this. This is called Unimix and it's very simple. It's made from rice, and ground, ground rice and ground lentils, which is a small kind of bean or pea, which is very common and very cheap in Bangladesh. Oil, sugar, and water. And it's highly nutritious. And almost all of the children who are uh, in the communities around these self-help groups, around these nutrition and food security programs, are malnourished. They are underweight and they don't get enough vitamins. So they teach them how to make this and have the kids eat it once a day. And uh, we ask the widows, in, I mean not the widows, the women in the self-help group, uh, if this self-help group was making a difference in their lives. And one of the things they said is, yes, they taught us how to use the Unimix and some other things. And now our children are much healthier. After just a year and a half, they can see the difference in their children's lives. Their weight has gone up, their normal weight instead of really skinny, they're healthier, they don't get sick as much. So today, we're going to live in communion, in solidarity, together with our brothers and sisters in Bangladesh, with the Church of the Nazarene that is teaching kids in the poorest of the poor families uh, to eat this meal once a day. We've got spoons here. After you take communion, you can grab one spoon, if they're not sticking together, and just dip it in and take a little bite, uh, and you can experience uh, what, I guess, probably 100,000 kids in Bangladesh who are connected with this program eat once a day as a way to help them have healthier bodies, which then will help them have healthier minds and hearts. And uh, it was beautiful to see how the pastor uh, was interacting with all of these people. Uh, he's not the leader of the program, but he's there in the midst of the program, helping these people who don't know anything about Jesus understand uh, who Jesus is and why the church is doing these food security projects and helping them save money and make, better make a better home for their families. Okay, now I want to invite our servers to come up. Mm -hmm. 
So let me, this is a little different than usual, so at, let me give a few instructions. As you come, uh, you can uh, drop a gift in here, or if you're new among us, just uh, use one of the cards in your bulletin, write down uh, who you are and, and how we can get in touch with you. We just want to say thanks for coming and get to know you a little more. Also on the cards, there are talk back. There's a talk back space. So if you have a question about uh, the sermon today or about life in general, somebody has been, a few people have shared some really profound questions. Just write that down. Or if you have a question about our partnership with Bangladesh, uh, write it down. And uh, next Sunday, I uh, will share some responses in the bulletin or in front. And then just take a piece of the bread and dip it in the cup. And you can eat it right away. And then, oh, I already got a spoon here. Just take a spoon and dip it, and you can also eat that. And then there's a blue can over here. You can drop your spoon in. <coughs> if you'd like for one of us to pray with you, there's oil here. We'll be happy to anoint you as a sign of God's spirit in your life. God's healing uh, presence for rescue, refuge, and rehabilitation. Just take a seat there, and one of our pastors will be there to pray for you. Actually, Adam and Sujin, if you could be the people praying, then that would be great. Now, uh, let's pray as we prepare to come. Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on, on us, and on this bread, and on this cup, and on this unimix signs of your presence with us and signs of our commitment to our partners in Bangladesh. Draw us to you. Wrap us in your love and grace. And may these simple signs be a means for our transformation, our healing, so that we can participate more fully in the healing of our world through your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Come whenever you're ready. May God bless you as you come.
us to hear some stories from uh, some of our team members who went on our trip to Bangladesh. What we're going to do is for the next month, we'll take two or three team members at a time and each person will tell, tell a different story about something that was meaningful to them. Next week, we'll have our full picture PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we weren't able to get it ready this week. It was a quick turnaround for us. Uh, but today, I want to invite up uh, Joey and Pete. Name me which one of you decided to share Pete and Giwan. So if you guys will just come on up. And the first one of you up here can go first, sharing your, your story. Now you're going to wait and, and try to get the others to go first. It is uh, strange for somebody that's an introvert to find themselves up front. But uh, I am convinced that when I am done speaking, I will uh, wish that I had said something different or added more to this. Um, this is not my, was not my first missions trip. Uh, I have been on a couple of others, and it is not my first time to be in a third world country. Um, the last time I was there, we were greeted at the airport with, uh, with guards, with guns, and so forth. That was not the case in Bangladesh. We were rather greeted with traffic jams um, that were of a huge magnitude and uh, scared me worse than somebody carrying guns. Um, part of that is that the main roads in downtown Dhaka were two to three lanes with, oh, six, seven, eight lanes of traffic going. So um, the lanes of traffic didn't seem to matter a whole lot. Some of the things that impacted me the most um, were outside of the village of Hope. Um, as much as I was impacted by all that we saw and were able to do in the village, and um, as impressive as that was, I was with a background in management and leadership, I was very much impressed with the CDCs, um, the child development centers that we got to visit. Josh talked a little bit about one this morning um, where we got to taste some of the food. Um, but the fact that we have a, a church that cares so much about people living their lives um, as they have learned to live them and trying to find ways to keep them within their own culture but help them to raise their awareness of well-being is, uh, is a phenomenal task. Uh, to think in terms of trying to train people in proper use of crop rotations, uh, of use of crops, or even of eating nutritious food was, uh, is uh, something that boggles my mind because it is something that I have grown up with, I uh, haven't had to think about. Uh, to think in terms of helping people understand there's a reason that we have toilets as opposed to just stopping wherever you are. Uh, that there's health issues that are involved with those kind of life decisions. Um, to begin to understand what it means to have clean water um, and to eat healthy food uh, was something that I found uh, shockingly um, underdeveloped and our church of the Nazarene Church is working to help people understand better how to live their lives better. And the cool thing, as far as I was concerned, was that we haven't been handing out dollars, we've been handing out knowledge. And um, that knowledge is beginning to raise communities, not just the little group of people that we're able to touch with a CDC or a church. It's, it sneaks out beyond that. And every time we were at one of these child development centers where we got to share the gospel and where we got to teach in classrooms, hanging on the windows were people that were not part of that particular child development center or that particular church, but were hanging on the words of these strange looking people that had come to their village. Um, and the word of God is sneaking out and eking out uh, because the church has chosen a path that might be a little bit different um, in spreading the gospel than just meeting in a church building um, and hoping somebody that's lost will come in and find us. Um, the church is finding that we feel that we need to heal people where they hurt um, to help them understand that we care about their bodies and their minds and their souls. 
And so we have been, as a church, busy helping them improve their, their physical lives. And we've been busy helping them improve their educational experiences. Um, and we've also been busy sharing the gospel. We got to spend one evening seeing a part of the Jesus film being shown. And I had the opportunity of speaking with the um, missionary from the Church of the Nazarene who is, um, whose sole responsibility is the Church of the Nazarene and the Jesus film. And he was saying in Bangladesh, the church is growing exponentially greater than any other place that, that the Jesus film is being shown because we cannot overtly ask people to raise their hand and say, do you want to accept Christ? We have to ask them to hand in a card and say, come and visit me at my house and tell me about this movie I've just seen. And as a result, we're having one-on-one -on -one contacts with individuals as opposed to mass evangelism. And more and more of those people are beginning to grasp what it means to have a loving God who, is, who has sent these people this message that says, I love you. And, and their lives are being changed. The, the, the church is growing. Um, God's church is growing. The Nazarene church is growing as well. But the church in general is growing because uh, of the work of this Jesus film of people that have sacrificed um, their lives with family um, by giving up um, relationships that they would have with their family because they've accepted Christ and turned away from their, their growing up religion. Um, I have come away humbled by these people who pay such a big price to serve Christ and how easy it is to live here in Korea or in America. Um, and not know the price that it costs to be a Christian. Um, I was impressed with the, with the group that we traveled with. Uh, the, the youth from this team did an awesome job. Um, and I would love to brag on all five of you, six if you count Taylor, she's a little older team. Uh, but uh, you, you have a lot to be proud of in the folks that you are growing here among these young, young folks. Um, and I was pleased to be a part of this group. I am Ikiwan, and hi, I'm a university student in this. And, okay. and I just want to say one thing, the most impressive thing. Uh, on the first day, um, village kids standing at the gate and sang a welcome song and gave us beautiful flower. And to my surprise, they bent over to put their hands to our feet and touch them to their heart, like this. I am a village kid. And pick a flower. And it means I respect you. For the first time through my life, I felt the value of existence strongly. I am just a common student from South Korea for the mission work as a volunteer. And I'm not a celebrity, I'm not a famous singer, and I'm not a president. Yeah. But they really welcome us with their powerful respect, and I found they are not mandatory to do so. They were feeling so happy and grateful, grateful as we were three with them, um, as we were there with them. And we loved them and we are also loved. Um, I felt I'm like in, I'm in heaven. Although I have, I had no experience, not in, I, I had not experience in heaven, but maybe in heaven like, maybe I felt heaven and there was full of love. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Joey and I'm a second grade in, in middle school. And in Bangladesh, I felt and saw many things over there. And there are so many things that I've experienced and felt overwhelmed in Bangladesh. So I'll just tell you a part of it. First, like Kiwan said, they touched our feet and touched their heart um, to show respect to us. And when they did that, I felt kind of yeah, I'm, I'm not really worth a person to respect that much and 
Yeah, I don't know. I felt a lot of things <laughs> when they did it. And the thing that changed after going to Bangladesh, um, first I thought, why not help children in Korea when there are still a lot of poor children in Korea, even though we got wealthier than before. And after going to Bangladesh, um, they were in, they couldn't eat, and they didn't have enough food and water to survive. And um, I don't know how to explain it, but I was kind of shocked of how they live. That's it. <laughs> The, the kids. Thank you, Joey and Yuan. I think Joey's probably talking about the village that we went to where, where there was the food security project. That was by far the poorest area we went to. Uh, many, many of the kids, boys or girls, didn't have shirts. Didn't, all, none of the children had shoes. I, they clearly, visibly, had not had a bath for a long time. The mud was on their bodies and in their hairs. Uh, and when they did have a bath, it was probably together with their cows and goats and other animals in the muddy pond. So uh, that was a, a, for us, where we can just turn on the faucet and get clean water and maybe complain if it's not hot or if it's too hot or too cold, uh, that is a really shocking experience. I guess uh, I'll take my pastoral privilege and share a story too. Uh, this will be the, just real quickly right before we go. Uh, on the last night when we're leaving, you know, everybody's crying, we're crying, everybody on our team, man, woman, and child is crying. They're all crying, everybody there. And I said, okay, I want to hug all of the kids. And I'm thinking, one by one. And I don't know what the translator said, but 30 kids just made a mob of love around me. And it was the most moving moment of the trip for me. I, I was down on one knee, ready to hug them one at a time, and they just squeezed me and squeezed me, and they're crying. And I felt in that moment God's love for, for me and for us. All right, I'm sorry, we don't have time to sing our last song. Would you stand? Two announcements. Two announcements before you go. Uh, one is I want to remind you in two weeks, uh, our children's church will be splitting into kindergarten and elementary. So basically old enough to go without you up to kindergarten age uh, in one room and in the other room uh, any kid in elementary and our curriculum will be splitting too the older kids will get a more developed curriculum uh, suited more suited to older kids and the younger kids will have a simpler curriculum and both groups our plan is to increase the bilingual aspect of it a little bit so there's a little bit more Korean than we've had in the past and if you would like to help with one of those groups, uh, talk to Matt. I think he's with the kids today. Uh, we need uh, lots of help with teachers and with helpers, just sitting with the kids. If you're a parent of a kid who goes to the class, uh, we really want to encourage you to volunteer once every month or two. Matt will put you on a rotation. You don't have to do it very often. And you don't even have to prepare. Just show up and help the teacher take care of the kids. And last, yesterday was uh, our son John David's first birthday party. About a hundred of you and our friends from around Chonon came and uh, shared the celebration with us. I just want to say thanks. We, we felt really loved and cared for. So uh, thank you for being good friends to us. Now receive the blessing. May God pour out his grace and mercy and love into our souls and help us to live with grace and mercy and love for others. Go in peace to be a loving community that changes our world. Amen.
Thank you. 